Hi class. Today we're going to understand and read and learn about Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative. This PowerPoint presentation is based on some work that a former student of mine, Josh Long, did in a class oh long ago. Josh went on to get his MA and teach at uh, Western Christian and now he is an adjunct professor at APU. Mary Rowlandson was born to John and Joan White Rowlandson. She had several children, and like many Puritan parents, she experienced the death of her children at early ages. Of course, in the narrative, we learn that she had a young child who died at the house during the assault. Joseph, her eldest son, who was 14, was taken captive, as was Mary. They did survive. Unfortunately, Sarah the babe she carried in her arms died while she was in captivity. Uh, Mary's husband, Joseph Rowlandson, was a minister of some prominence, which was one of the reasons why she was kidnapped. He was, of course, away from the house that evening, which in allowed the uh, ransom to occur or the event to occur. Well, you need a little bit of context, a historical context for the situation. And, of course, they were in the middle of King Philip's War, which was a skirmish, more than a skirmish, actually, uh, a battle between the Pequot Indians and the Anglo-American settlers. This timeline gives you an idea of the events that led to the escalation that led to the assault. It is fairly complicated, but the bottom line is uh, that in 1644, the Plymouth Colony seized Wamsuda, who was a Wampanoag chief, in order to get him to relinquish an early pact with England, entitling him to full rights to his land. Uh, in the meantime, he died in captivity, but Medicom, his son Philip, agreed. So King Philip's War refers to the son of Wamsuda. So from 1674 on, there was a back and forth uh, series of events that included the murder of a praying Indian. Now, praying Indian was an Indian who converted to Christianity. And as a converted Indian, he enjoyed neither respect from his native tribe nor from the Anglo-American settlers. The bottom line is that the war resulted in a devastation of the population of the Native American tribes in the area including uh, the group called Ungonquian, the Wampanoags, Narangasets, and the Mohegans. This is the timeline of Mary Rowlandson's life. And rather than going through all the different events, let's get right to uh, the relevant dates. In 1675, basically, the town felt rather threatened by uh, the... King Philip's War, and from the various uh, individual assaults on neighboring villages. So Joseph the minister went to go and get help in Boston, and Lancaster was attacked at that time. During this time, Mary was, of course, taken captive along with her uh, daughter who died in her arms and her elder two children, Mary and Joseph. So after the events that resulted in this narrative and restoration of Mary, uh, Joseph died in 1679 and Mary remarried. Uh, th of course, she outlived both of her husbands and earned quite a bit of unprecedented fame as one of the only influential Puritan women writers. The book was published in 1682, and it is our first captivity narrative, and as such, set the format for it. Now, captivity narratives were considered escapist literature, and it was second only to the Day of Doom. Of course, it was rare because a Puritan woman wrote it. Lancaster, Ma uh, Massachusetts is the home of the events that occurred, Mary Ransom's native village. Well, not native, she was actually born elsewhere, but this is, of course, where her house was attacked. And there is, of course, a, uh, a marquee, as you can see. 
So what is a captivity narrative exactly? And here is a definition. A narrative whose primary focus is to record the experiences of individuals of European or African origin who had actually been captured by American Indians. It may also include fictitious narratives, oral tales, and parts of other works. It is distinguished from other kinds of narratives, such as slave narratives, written by captive African Americans, and also uh, it tends to include, the captivity narrative tends to include anyone who had been taken uh, captive by natives. Now this is where it gets a little tricky. Some um, immigrants were actually African in origin and the very few free blacks who were captured uh, did fall in, under this category. If they wrote a narrative of their capture by the Indians, then they were, it was considered a captivity narrative. All right, so why were Anglos and immigrants taken captive by the Native American tribes? This is a fairly broad generalization. However, there was a pattern to some of the reasoning. Number one, uh, in the case of, well, not necessarily in the case of Mary Rowlandson, but in, in subsequent captures, revenge was, was a motive. The Indians wanted revenge on the uh, neighboring settlers. Ransom was, was another reason uh, to earn money and to, to gain power and influence and prestige. Uh, the interesting, one of the most interesting motives, of course, was that of adoption. Now, why that? We're talking primarily of captivity of younger children, especially women, in order to help the tribes regain and repopulate. Slavery was a minor motive. It was rare, but occasionally these uh, captives were treated as slaves. So, who were taken captive? Males in their 20s were generally killed and tortured. Male captives were rare. If they were taken, they were very young. Uh, they were, and but on the other hand, if they were young, they were usually adopted, especially girls. And believe it or not, sexual abuse was very rare. They were not taken to be abused or raped, but instead to either be used as workers or to help repopulate the tribe. And often they intermarried with the natives. And uh, as you're going to find out in our reading for Friday, there was a, uh, a very interesting phenomena across the centuries after the uh, 1675 event. And that was that a lot of the natives, or excuse me, a lot of the Anglo-Americans did not return to their families, but instead decided that the native tribes were their home. The text itself, of course, can be characterized according to standard literary features, structure, point of view, style, characterization, and, of course, uh, emotional impact. Uh, so, a captivity narrative follows a, a fairly predictable pattern. There's a capture and then an initiation of the captive where she must decide to either get out or get along, and then usually a return. Uh, and the attack is often a turning point in the captive's life. As we see in Mary Rowlandson, she viewed it in a couple of different ways. Number one, she viewed it as a punishment from God, a trial, and because of the teachings of Christianity, as you know, trials are often used um, or understood to be used by God to perfect uh, the soul. And, um, understandably, there were a number of biblical interpretations offered of her experiences. So some of the text, of course, was divided in point of view between that voice telling what happened versus that voice telling what we were to make of it. So the narrator was both a participant and a commentator. Style, of course, is the use of language. And characterization is the development of the characters in the narrative, whether they were based on true uh, members of the events or not. So uh, the tone, of course, was one of terror, awe, and in some cases, abject humility. 
And there is an occasional very poetic use of language, such as those phrases that stand out, at least in my memory. One of them was, of course, the simile of bullets flying like hail, but also the part where she says that they had assaulted her um, to the point where she stood in her uh, front yard with the, rut, the blood running down to her heels. This indicates that there was quite a community or communion with the audience. Mary Rowlandson was very aware of the kinds of attitudes and expectations her audience had and the kind of information they needed. How did she deal with it? What did they do to her? Um, how did she get out of it? Uh, how did God work in all of this? So the major character of focus for us is the narrator herself, the captive. She's both captive and composer of the narrative. And over the course of the narrative, she is supposed to show growth and development. Correspondingly, only certain characters are developed. It isn't a fully rounded narrative. Um, some are only briefly mentioned. It was a very instrumental uh, attitude towards the events that occurred. Only those characters that had a direct contact or somehow were ancillary in developing her character are mentioned. And of course, here's that phrase that I remember. Thus, we were butchered by those merciless heathens standing amazed with the blood running down our heels, our own heels. So the emotional impact of this narrative, essentially, all of us can imagine the event and trauma of kidnapping. Uh, it has always been a sensational item in the news. It appeals to our experience of cultural and personal integration, disintegration, and then reintegration. And of course, you know about the Stockholm Syndrome, where the captive develops feelings for the captors. And we can see a little bit of that, not necessarily uh, to the extent or the melodrama that's portrayed in contemporary media, but you know, there's several things happening. On the one side, she's trying to understand who she is in God's plan. Secondly, she's trying to understand how far she is able to change in order to survive. And then lastly, uh, she finds that she must be reintegrated into society despite the fact that she has seen life from a whole other point of view. Um, and we enjoy this particular narrative because it does have so many different layers and shows us so many different aspects of the Puritan culture. So while we can recognize the ideology because it is in some ways, although understandable, it also is foreign to us. So we always are in the position of having to reinterpret uh, what it would have been like and how she was in the fact interpreting. Ideology is just considered to be the sort of obvious set of beliefs that someone believes and you don't. <laughs> we don't really understand our own ideology until it is made, uh, until it is displaced and put into a foreign context. So one of the major tropes for this narrative is that of trial, suffering, ransom, and redemption because it is consonant with the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of course, suffering brings about character according to Christian teachings. And the quotation we have here, of course, reflects that. So some people get all of their bad luck in one fell swoop, others gradually. And so her metaphor is, of course, like a sweeping rain that leaveth no food, did the Lord prepare to be my portion. She only could be in communion with Lord, the Lord in a new way through such affliction. So, some questions that you may have. And, of course, these questions were questions that my student Josh wrote for the class at the time. But, of course, they capture some of the paradoxes. 
How is it that a nation could be captivated and terrified at the thought of capture by the Indians, yet negligent and irresponsible enough to allow the enslavement of an entire race? Of course, that is one of the key questions of this course. Like, what were the causes of slavery? How could we live with it? And then secondly, um, why do you think that these popular narratives had such a huge influence and yet so little effect on the continued enslavement? Um, and I would, I would answer or venture one pot uh, potential answer being departmentalization in the fact that these were considered to be not relevant or not the same as a whole economic system. The economic system and the treatment of African Americans was made possible by some racist views. Uh, yes, Native Americans were different and foreign just like the African Americans were, but they were also a different kind of people and therefore their threats were different. It wasn't seen, they weren't seen quite the same. They were both below or um, inferior to the white race according to white ideology. But of course, because of this departmentalization, because it, people could put things in boxes, uh, they could keep them separated as well. So this is a, <laughs> Josh happened to be very skillful with PowerPoint. And if you actually look at the PowerPoint apart from this recording, you will note that there are all kinds of special effects and he was able to superimpose this image of his young self. Now, here's a work cited, and I just simply wanted to point out that this hypertext here, the last item on the list, this one here, is actually a very good resource if you're interested in this topic for further research. All right, everybody, I'll see you in class tomorrow.